So I just want to uh, spend a few minutes talking to you guys about uh, Green Bank Observatory and all the cool stuff that we do at Green Bank. Uh, this is mostly to just give you some context about the, the telescope and the observatory and things like that. Some of which, of course, you would get to get to see if you were here on site. So to try to give you a feel for what you would see, give you an overview, and you'll get a lot more details, of course, as the, uh, the week goes on. So first, let me welcome you virtually to Green Bank Observatory. The sky is not quite this clear today. It's a little bit overcast, but still a, still a pretty day out there. So who and what are Green Bank Observatory? Well, up on the screen, you can see our mission statement. But basically, Green Bank Observatory exists in order to provide both telescopes and instruments for scientific research in the radio astronomy realm. But we also do a lot with education. And this workshop is a good example of the type of education we do reaching out to, uh, to people within the astronomy field. But we also do a lot of outreach to the general public, as well as to students to get them interested, not just in astronomy, but in science and engineering in general. So the Green Bank site itself, if you were here, you would get to see a lot of different telescopes. We've been here for more than 60 years, and we have a wide variety of telescopes here on site. If you can see the image here, you'll see a variety of different telescopes, different sizes and shapes, all of which were completed starting with the earliest back in the 1960s, all the way up to our most recent, most modern telescope, which is the 100 meter Green Bank Telescope. The majority of the telescopes still exist here on site. The one exception is our old 300 foot telescope, which is on the screen in the middle right. It was completed in 1962. It was built actually as a prototype design to try out some ideas like all good prototypes. It just got uh, upgraded and repaired and lasted a very long time until the late 1980s when it collapsed due to a structural flaw. The collapse of that telescope then paved the way for the GBT, which was already a design on the books and we've been thinking about for quite a while. The GBT was completed in 2000, and it's the primary instrument that we use here on site, and it's a telescope, of course, the, the Observer Training Workshop is going to focus on. So what is the GBT? Like I said, it's an absolutely fantastic telescope. It's a fully steerable telescope, so that means we can see all but 15% of the southernmost part of the sky. We can tip down to just five degrees above the horizon. Currently, the instrumentation on the GBT goes uh, the, at the lower end from about 0.3 gigahertz to the higher ends at 116 gigahertz. The higher end is set by the atmospheric opacity. It doesn't make a lot of sense to go above that here. The lower end is just set by interest. So we could actually put and have put in the past uh, lower frequency receivers on the telescope, but we simply don't have any up right now as there hasn't been the interest for it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the unblocked aperture on the telescope, but I will just emphasize the fantastic sensitivity of the GBT. It's so even up at 100 gigahertz, we're at 30% aperture efficiency. And in a typical year, we get about 6,800 hours of um, time available on the telescope for scientific research. The user community for the GBT is, is broad and fantastic. We get about uh, 3,000 individual scientists use, uh, proposed to use the GBT over a five-year period. So every five years, we could relook and the numbers stay about the same. With a very wide uh, span of disciplines, which you'll hear a bit about over this uh, workshop, but what's exciting to us and part of why we, we continue to have these workshops is that about 20% of our proposers are new each semester. So that gives us a very vibrant new community with new ideas, new science to use the telescope for, and a guarantee of a good base all of the time for our telescope. So as I said, the telescope itself has got an unblocked aperture. We're incredibly proud of this fact. This is a fairly new idea at the time it was built into the GBT. So what you can see here on the left is your classic um, radio telescope where you've got some nice struts holding up uh, your receiver sitting in the middle of it. And you can see the results of that is a lot of striping on the, the data that you get. Whereas on the right with the GBT and unblocked aperture, this is not a processed image that you see for the GBT. You can just see the incredible dynamic range that we get, the incredible clear image that we get with our unblocked aperture. This is the reason that a lot of the newer telescopes being designed and built now are unblocked. For example, the SKA being built in South Africa is all going to be an unblocked aperture. The NGVLA design, if it is to be built, will also be unblocked. GBT, as I said, has fantastic performance. This is uh, the first data that was actually taken with the GBT up at 109 gigahertz. And what you can see on this is the, uh, the, the diamonds are showing you your uh, predicted theoretical beam for the telescope. And then you can see the actual data sitting underneath. This wasn't on a particularly great day or anything else but it really just shows you the overall performance of the GBT. 
We're losing what we expect. Of course, we're not perfect. We're at 30% aperture efficiency up at 100 gigahertz. But what we get to see here is that we just have very, very good response to the telescope and it's behaving exactly the way we expect it to behave. As I said, frequency coverage all the way up to 116 gigahertz. And here you can actually see the incredible sensitivity that you get with that. I'll emphasize that most of the receivers that we have underneath a, a 10 gigahertz and lower are all single pixel receivers. Above that, we go to at least dual pixel receivers. That allows you to, uh, to look at the atmosphere and your source at the same time. We do, though, have a number of multi-pixel cameras, as we call them, available on the GBT. So we have one at K-band, and then we have two up at around 100 gigahertz. One's a bolometer array, one's a traditional feed horn array system. All of this runs onto uh, our primary backend, which is an FPGA and GPU-based backend that does both um, does both pulsar and continual observations, and it can also it's primarily used for uh, spectral line observations as well. So that's kind of the GBT as it is. You're going to hear a lot about the GBT as it is right now. Let's look ahead to the future. Where is the GBT going? In order to figure out where we want to go with the GBT, we, we get the community together. We bring you guys all together to help us plan for the future of the telescope because this telescope exists for the, for the astronomy community. So a few years ago, we had a, a meeting to talk about where we thought the GBT should go over the next decade, the decade that was, that was being planned, which is 2020 to 2030. And this was the basic idea. This was the basic roadmap that that community came up with. So you can see at the base here, you've got a lot of infrastructure upgrades to make sure that new instruments have a good infrastructure sitting on top of it. Then the idea was to go out and look at individual feed horns and see if we can optimize them for the science, either cooling them down a whole lot or um, increasing the bandwidth. So you can, for example, for pulsar studies, get higher sensitivity by increasing your bandwidth, you're looking at total, total power coming in. So you, you get higher sensitivity there. We looked a lot about at the thought of radio cameras, for example, and how many pixels can we stick up onto the sky so we can map things very quickly. And then also thought a little bit about new capabilities and what new capabilities might be coming down the path that we would wanna take advantage of. So that was the, the, the uh, path we outlined at this meeting. And I'm happy to say that we've been moving along that path pretty successfully. Got a number of new things going on on the telescope that over the next year or so will be will be opened up for use. Uh, one of the exciting projects is this uh, LASI. This is a laser active scanning surface scanning instrument, or just LASI if you don't want to remember the acronym. The idea here is that we want to improve the infrastructure of the telescope. We want to improve the performance of the dish of the telescope, even under less than benign weather conditions. So we want to get that 30% aperture efficiency not just in the best weather conditions, but even as we get, for example, the dish starting to heat up and cool down in the middle of the day and things like that, we wanna start opening up for high frequency science. So the idea here is you put, put a laser scanner up on the telescope and you can actually see the housing of that down in the bottom center of this picture. And then it points down on the telescope, it scans the dish, it compares that against what it should be. And then the, uh, the dish corrects itself. We have actuators on the dish that'll correct itself out there. So this will really increase the number of high frequency hours up on the telescope. Commissioning for this instrument is well underway. And in fact, the uh, final review for phase one of this project is being planned. So this should be out and in use, hopefully by this fall for phase one. We're then gonna start working on that now that we understand how to use the, teles the instrument on the telescope. Moving into phase two, which will be the phase where we really start to increase the high frequency hours on the GBT. Uh, if you remember back to that list again, we started, we talked about trying to optimize the feeds on the telescope, and this is one of the ways that we're doing that. This is a new wideband feed that's going up onto the GBT uh, within a year. This is actually uh, uh, funded by the Moore Foundation to uh, build a feed Form that's specifically designed for pulsar work and in fact for pulsar timing for the nanograv team, but it'll be usable for all sorts of pulsar timing as well as for spectral line work for anybody that's interested in covering a very wide bandwidth. So this goes from 0.7 to 4 gigahertz um, uh, with an aim of about 30 degrees Kelvin across the entire bandwidth. So that would be the average TSIS across the whole thing. And it also comes with the back end. So we're doubling the back end on the GBT with this as well, so that we'll be able to take advantage of the full bandwidth without having to decrease our, um, our resolution for pulsar timing. Hand in hand with that, again, looking at some of the infrastructure that needs to go with it, we have a couple of awards. One of these is to digitize the um, input. So as you bring the data into the wideband feed to go ahead and digitize it, 
and then actually look for RFI and mitigate that, remove it from your scan so that it doesn't even make it down into your final data reduction. So this is a project that is underway. Um, the goal is to deploy this on the ultra wideband feed that as it comes online. Right now, this is focused primarily on the algorithm side of things. We won't necessarily get this fully deployed and out there. First, we have to understand how to do it. But again, it's going to really increase the sensitivity of that wideband feed by removing RFI out of the picture and allowing us to get data, even in the, in the cases where RFI might be present part of the time. Then another big infrastructure project we have going on right now, right outside my window here, is a new data archive center. So up till now, the data from the GBT that is archived has been limited to certain types of data, and only that data has been accessible to the public. So we are going to archive all GBT NSF funded Open Skies data in this building. We're also working on an upgrade to the archive access tool to make it readily easy for anybody to go and mine our data archive to get the type of data to find out what observations there are and to get the data themselves. So this is gonna be very cost-effective means. It's um, an exciting project for us. It's a brand new building here on site and it's gonna be a completely RFI sealed building to keep of course the noise down on site. So that building uh, hopefully will be showing up here pretty soon and we'll have it completely done by the end of the summer. At least that's the plan. <clears throat> Finally, going back to new instruments. Uh, again, if you think about those optimized feeds, we also talked about trying to uh, build the best possible feed for the science. And that's what we're doing right now with our X-band. So we're in the process of replacing our, our eight to 10 gigahertz uh, X-band feed with one that's actually gonna go from eight to 12 gigahertz. It's also got a higher cooling capacity, so it means uh, less maintenance, less issues with it, and improved baseline stability, which is something that observers have asked us for a lot. So it should have a nice stable baseline on the telescope. Uh, this is being built right now. It's actually in the shop and is planned to be commissioned by the end of this year. So it should be available for use, hopefully sometime early next, uh, next year in 2022. And finally, if you think about those plots, we also talked about um, ways to, to increase just the type of science we can do here on site. And this is one of the exciting new ways we're going to do that. So the uh, Green Bank Observatory is getting a new CHIME outrigger antenna. So CHIME is a series of antennas up in Canada that are being used for a variety of different things, both to uh, look at the uh, re reionization era of H1, but it's also been a fantastic instrument for discovering fast radio bursts. The problem though, is with all the antennas packed up there in Canada, they're not able to pinpoint in the sky where those fast radio bursts are happening, which is really too bad. You wanna know where they are so you can really start to study all sorts of cool details about them. And so they're putting an outrigger antenna, one of these big chime antennas here in Green Bank. Uh, the site's already prepped for it and it should be coming here hopefully this summer. Then once that's in place, they're also looking at the idea of putting some smaller antennas near that and all of this combined will then let us work um, directly with the chime array in real time to help detect these fast radio bursts and pinpoint them in the sky so we can learn a lot more about those absolutely fantastic um, and exciting new phenomena that that people are, are discovering and another really big new area that the gbt is getting into is on the radar side so traditionally the gbt has always been a passive instrument that means that we receive signals, but we do not transmit signals with the GBT. Um, we have done radar work in the past, but it's always been on the bi-static receive end. So somebody else transmits, uh, was Arecibo or the Goldstone Telescope. They'll transmit a radar system. It bounces off some object, and then we get to receive that signal. Well, we're changing that around, and we're looking into putting a very powerful planetary-sized radar system on the GBT itself. The idea would be that the GBT would transmit and the GBT would probably not be the receive, but instead the receive antennas would be um, starting with the VLBA antennas that are spread out around the United States. And then eventually if the NGVLA is built, it would be the receive antennas or perhaps some other antennas would be the receive side. So we uh, tested this idea out. We actually borrowed a uh, 700 watt, 14 gigahertz transmit system and uh, working with our partners Raytheon actually did a whole slew of modifications to it and got it up on the GBT took some fantastic data and you can see that data here on the right. This is a, actually an inverted image of the Apollo 15 landing site with five meter resolution data. So just with our little uh, prototype system up there, it's the highest resolution data that's known um, taken from earth of this site. 
And we're now working towards phase two. So that was absolutely fantastic. We're now looking at something that'll be in the 50 to hundreds of kilowatt transmits on the GBT. As of right now, it's looking like it's gonna be up in the KA band range. So around 35 gigahertz, although the community is still discussing that a bit. Like I said, we'll initially have the VLBA as our receive system, but then the NGVLA. So we're planning this project. The project planning is fully underway. We are still seeking funding for it to kick off. Once we get fully funded, we anticipate it'll be about three years between um, initial funding being received and the uh, beginning of commissioning of this instrument. So it's a pretty exciting brand new capability that the GBT will see. And then finally, well, the funding isn't there yet. I do wanna point out that we're looking at our radio cameras as well. So we haven't forgotten that part of our list. We're very excited about the idea of expanding our radio cameras. And the big push so far has been for the Argus 144 instrument. So right now we have a 16 pixel uh, receiver that's up on the, the GBT that works from about um, mid eighties, 85 to 116 gigahertz. What we'd like to do is take that 16 pixel instrument, which was a prototype and expand it out to make it to a full 144, 100 to 144 pixel instrument up on the GBT. The science that can be done with this is absolutely amazing. Um, you get really high resolution, you know, eight arc second resolution across a four by four arc minute region of the sky very quickly. So we're excited about this idea. We really want to push for it. Unfortunately, the project has not yet been funded. We did look for the NSF MSIP program last round. Unfortunately, we did not get accepted, but we're continuing to work with the community to refine our science case on this with the hope the funding for it will become available before too long. So that was a lot of different things that I just put out there, a lot of different ideas, a lot of different new instruments coming online with the GBT. I just want to back up and look at it one more time. So once again, this was that plan that we put together um, to look, work with the community to decide where the GBT should be going over this, this current decade. And I just want to emphasize that we're doing incredibly well with this. So on the infrastructure side, we've got a number of different things. Uh, with Lassie, a new archive facility, as well as the R&D underway for this uh, digitized IF. We've got a couple optimized feeds out there that should be up and running certainly by next year. Uh, we're working on funding for our Argus 144 camera. We're very excited about that idea, as well as working on funding for the radar system. And then we have new capabilities with Chime, and we are beginning to work with the NGVLA group to talk about where the GVT fits within the NGVLA and should have some more uh, exciting news on that coming out over the next few months. So really just an incredibly uh, fantastic future moving forward over the next 10 years. And we're very excited about all the instrumentation and capabilities that we'll have with the telescope. So what comes after that? We actually have gone through that workshop and we're doing a lot of those things. And we anticipate over the next five or so years that a lot of those, those boxes are gonna be checked. So we're gonna have a lot of new capabilities within the decade for the GBT, but the question then becomes, where do we go after that? What's the next big step? We clearly need to define the role of the GBT and Green Mac Observatory in the era of all the new telescopes that are coming online, the NGVLA, the SKA, all of those. We need to understand the GBT's role within the NGVLA antenna site. And of course, how the new radar system that we're hoping to build will interplay both for the GBT and the NGVLA's plans. So really what I want to emphasize with this is that you guys are the future. You guys are the people that are going to help us figure out what the next big steps for the GBT is. We're going to be talking with the community over the next year to try to set up some workshops and some planning information for where the GBT should go and lay out that next 10 year plan to start talking about where we want to go from 2025 to 2035 or even to 2040 with the GBT. Looking at the world's instruments, looking at the GBT's roles within those instruments and making a plan. So you guys are the basis for this. And I just encourage you when you see our booth at the AAS meeting, the virtual AAS, or maybe even face-to-face -face sometime in the future here to come and, and talk with us about your ideas and where you think we ought to go with everything. So that's everything I just wanted to say, except once again, uh, welcome to Green Bank. I'll take any questions if you happen to have any, but if not, feel free to ask people over the next week and with the workshop. So thank you guys. Thank you, Karen. I just put in the chat a couple minutes ago. If you do have any questions throughout, feel free to put them in the chat or you can raise your hand now if there's anything you would like to ask Karen. Go ahead, Atul. Yes, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, thanks. So I just wanna ask like uh, in the very beginning of the talk, you have mentioned that you are also uh, 
like uh, also observing some galaxies in the early cosmic time. So like, can you explain a bit? Like, are you observing some galaxies in the early universe or something? So the way the GBT works is all the science we do with our open skies time comes from uh, proposals from the community in general. So we certainly have had some proposals on the GBT to go look into uh, some of the earliest times pushing the GBT down to its lowest frequency range. We also have on site though, a number of instruments that are designed to do exactly that. We have um, an instrument called, uh, so we've got the low phasm instrument, which is a low frequency instrument that's doing a little bit of pros probing the earliest uh, days in the universe. We also have some chime prototype antennas that are designed to work at very low frequencies that are also probing the epoch of reionization uh, as part of the chime project. So those are the big ones. And then when the chime array comes on board, the new big array that's coming on, um, it will also be used partially for that, although the outrigger is, mo outrigger is mostly going to be used for um, identifying FRBs and things like that. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Well, if any questions do pop into your mind about what Karen presented, you can feel free to ask them throughout the workshop. We'll have staff members here um, every day. So thank you again, Karen. I'm gonna share my screen now for a few introductory slides. Let's see. Karen gave a great introduction to the science we do at the workshop. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the schedule and logistics for this week. So if you were in person, we would welcome you to Green Bank Observatory. We already did that. Uh, it's for the past few workshops, we've been doing these virtually and they've, they've been working out, but we would love to have you visit on site someday. Um, I, I think we expect to have visitors back sometime this fall hopefully. So Green Bank is located in what's called the National Radio Quiet Zone. We are protected from radio interference in part by the mountains that surround Green Bank, but also in part by some federal restrictions on what transmitters can be put up in that radio quiet zone, cell phone transmitters, TV broadcasts, etc. So it's, it's a very cool place to visit. We would invite you to come visit and explore the grounds. Uh, the only rule really is no electronic devices anywhere near the telescope. So once you pass a certain gate, uh, you shouldn't have any electronics on you. Uh, in your informational email I sent out last week, I included our site brochure, and there's also a 10% off coupon in there for our gift shop if you'd like to buy any Green Bank swag, uh, any t-shirts, things like that. So the goals for this workshop are one, become familiar with GBT observing modes and all of our user interfaces, which are specific to the GBT. Two, you'll practice standard data reduction techniques with your project friends. Everyone is in a group based on the interest that you put on your application. And um, one of the coolest parts is you'll get to actually control the GBT and learn how to observe remotely. So we'll do all these things. You will become proficient in GBT observing by the end of this workshop. But as I said, we would love to have you come visit in person someday. So what does our schedule look like? Well, it's mostly split up between Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, the reason being um, in previous workshops, we had a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday schedule, but we had observations overnight on both Monday and Tuesday. So it, it was fairly taxing on everyone involved. This way, you'll only have to stay up um, one night in a row for your observations and not into the middle of the night two days in a row. So Monday and Wednesday, we will have lectures from 9 to about 4.30 with observations overnight, again, on Monday and Wednesday, depending on your time zone. On Friday, we'll have a quick data reduction section in the morning, and then everyone will be able to tell us a little bit about what they observed. On Wednesday, I'll give, I'll give some instructions for what those presentations could look like. So in your chat in just a minute or so, I will post a link again to this schedule 
And you can see we're broken up primarily between Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But we will also be on call to so speak. Uh, and you can call in at 1 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday and Thursday if you would like to, to practice some extra data reduction or get any other tips and tricks from your group friends. After Dave Freyer's talk here in just a couple minutes, I will send out links to all of you for your uh, observing account. So I'll send you a message over Zoom with your account information. Uh, if you we don't have a new account for you, your project friend will be able to open a remote session for you for those observations. These include instructions on how to change your password and how to access our systems.